feels that God's been dealing with you about ministry, you want to make sure you have the right person accompanying that. And she might be the hottest one at camp, but she could be the greatest detriment to the future destiny that God has for you. I would not be here if it was not for my wife. I love her. And it's very rarely I travel without my family. There's usually an element of my family with me. And uh, the last week was South Dakota family camp. And we all have a Pentecostal hangover right now. And uh, also this week we have some summer camp activities for our children. In other words, they would be here with me. So I miss them. And so I will probably be in fetal position all week weeping. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 18 if you're there say amen if you're not say woman I'll be here all week I saw sister Serena somewhere too where is she at she already walked out look at that she's like I'm not singing I'm not going to be in service I'm just kidding Love Sister Serena. She's awesome. Went to school with her. Y'all are blessed. Y'all are blessed. Now, where remission, someone say remission. Now, where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Going back one chapter to chapter 9 and verse 22, it says, Almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without shedding of blood, someone say, is no remission. We just read two verses here that are close in proximity discussing where there is remission and where there is no remission. And I feel like teaching tonight, and that might bore you. You might, I don't know, tune out the rest of the week, but I'm I'm not the kind of person that tries to build hype. Um, I try to be sensitive to the Holy Ghost, and I try to help. I really want to help. We've, We've had decades of cranking your motor, getting you pumped up, but we need some things that will sustain us. And I'm not, I, there's a time to praise, there's a time to shout, there's a time to chew on walls and all that kind of stuff, but uh, I, I want to help you. I really want to help you, and not, not just me, but the Holy Ghost wants to help you. Would you ask God to speak to us in these next few moments right now as we talk about where no remission is? Lord, I pray right now in the name of Jesus that your will would be done in these next few moments. I thank you for the privilege, the honor, the opportunity to be gathered together with the saints of God. Lord, with this generation, Lord, that you have brought for such a time as this. I thank you, Lord, to be with this generation upon whom the ends of the world have come. And I pray right now in the name of Jesus that, Lord, I do not quench the spirit. I pray I do not disrupt your will, but I pray I could be a channel a vessel, a conduit, Lord, that you can walk through, flow through, move through. And I pray right now that you would open up the windows of heaven, roll back the roof of this church, and fixate a ladder between heaven and earth. And may the angels of God ascend and descend upon this sanctuary. And may the divine walk up and down these aisles, Lord, between each row. And Lord, completely, absolutely, totally have your way today. Would you clap your hands to the Lord? Siéntete por favor en la presencia de Dios. You may be squatted in American. Where no remission is. Now, if I pass out, it's because I've never been in an atmosphere like this, by the way. Like, I got off the airplane, and I went to take a breath, and it was like, look, 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 look. I feel like I'm trapped inside King Kong's armpit. Hoofta. 
I don't know how you guys do it. You guys are like part marine animals or something. Back to focus here. Where no remission is, but I might pass out. <laughs> Everyone say remission. You know, if you're in the church culture long enough and hopefully you stick around church and hopefully you're reading your Bible, there's terms that are thrown out there that uh, we can hear quite frequently, quite often, and uh, just kind of get excited about it because we know it's the buzzword, it's the right word, and it is supposed to evoke a certain type of response or reaction. But if you ever, like, just pause and ask the definition of a word, you could kind of scratch your head and not be able to put a definition to it, though you may have a comprehension of it. There's a lot of words that I use that I have an idea of what it means, and I, I know contextually when to use the word, but if you cornered me and asked me, well, what does that word mean, I may struggle a little bit to define the word to accurately convey what it means. And one of the words that we use a lot in the apostolic church is a word called remission. Everyone say remission. It is important that we understand what remission is. It's it's, it's kind of cousins or twins or uh, Siamese twins and, uh, to a word called forgive or forgiveness. Everyone say forgiveness. I'm just making sure you're awake. There is forgiveness and there is remission. And they're very closely linked. In fact, they come from the same word when you study into the language of the Bible itself. The word forgive means to send off, to lay aside, to forsake. And remission is very similar, but it's a little more emphatic, though it's from the same word. It is a total freedom, a complete pardon, where forgiveness can be sent off, it can be laid down. But when you speak of remission, it is a complete, absolute liberty, a full pardon, a uh, a washing away, if you will. It is the difference between remission and forgiveness. It is why we have such strong emphasis when you're reading in the book of Acts chapter 2 verse 38 about baptism in the name of Jesus. It gives us a revelation and understanding that you can ask God for forgiveness when you repent, but God's not finished with what he is beginning in that process of salvation. He wants to totally, completely pardon, liberate, and wash away the very element that was forgiven. I want to read an article to you. I don't do this very often, but I have saved it. I'm not a big reader. I don't read much outside of the Bible, and it probably is very telling in my preaching and conversation but every now and again, I do come across something that intrigues me, that interests me, and I try to save it or capture it. And this is one of the moments of an interview done with a man named Eric Schmidt. Does anyone know who Eric Schmidt is? Has anyone ever heard of Google? Well, there you go. He was a, one of the longest founding uh, components, founders of Google. Anyone ever used Google before? All right, so I'll just you know, say praise the Lord, Brother Eric Schmidt. I'm just kidding, not Brother Eric Schmidt. But Eric Schmidt is a, was a key figure, and he's still involved with it, but he has since um, stepped away from being CEO. But he was sat down in an interview, and this is what I want to share with you in this interview. And the statement is this. It must be peculiar for children of the Internet age. They are the first to have a complete record of their whole lives. They are the first to be able to offer concrete proof of every one of their days, friends, and actions. Eric Schmidt worries, however, that they will be the first generation who will never be allowed to forget their mistakes. He said this, there are situations in life that it's better that they don't exist Especially if there is stuff you did when you were a teenager. Anyone ever do anything you regret as a teenager? Yes. There are things that you wish would never have happened, that you wish never existed. 
Teenagers are now in an adult world online. Some days you could hardly describe most of what happens online as adult. Still, Schmidt says he believes the online world has gone too far, enforcing teenagers to never forget. In bygone times, he said, they were punished, but allowed to grow beyond their youthful indiscretions. It's true that, as Eric Schmidt said in his speech, people are now sharing too much, what you would call TMI. In fact, Eric Schmidt gives this example, and this is not mine, it's his. He says, future parents posting ultrasounds of their unborn babies, TMI. Now, if you're here and you're a youth committee member or whatever, and you've done it, that's your prerogative. I'm just reading, not the Holy Script, just Eric Schmidt. But he says it's just TMI. There's just information not everybody needs to know. There's some things that should be private, some things that should be personal. But part of the problem that teens might encounter in the future comes not from their having made supposed mistakes. It's from those who might choose to judge them for those supposed mistakes. As ever in life, the opinions of others, especially in the sheep pen that is called the web, can be the most mistaken and most damaging distortion of all. You are what is called not just Generation Z, but some uh, daringly call you screenagers. And believe it or not, I'm not too far removed from your generation other than I'm like two or three times your age. In case you're wondering what a three-foot man that is uh, standing before you, the age is, I'm 37 on my way to heaven. And so the youngest in this room, I don't know, 12 years old, 13, I don't know how much they allow you all to be, how old to be here. You have to be at least this tall to be here, I know that. And so I've made it. I was hoping that you guys would have a junior camp that I could preach so I could like, you know, feel a little more like domineering or something. But when you get the teenager, people start like growing and voices are squeaking and all that kind of good stuff. But this generation of screenagers, one thing I have in common to you is that uh, in my teenage years, I was, I was raised in the advent of the Internet. And uh, our Internet was a little different than your Internet, though. is something called dial-up. You all ever heard of dial-up? It it's, it's one of the most profound things in the world. I, I wish you could experience dial-up Internet. You know, if, if you wanted to go online, it, what was amazing was there was something called AOL. I don't even know if that even exists anymore. But it's AOL Online, America Online. And you would get in the mail a CD. And the CD would be 24 hours of free internet. I'm like, 24 hours of free internet? There's no way I'm going to use all that. Like, how can I possibly spend 24 hours I mean, I'm telling you, I literally, I was like, that's a long time to be behind a con- computer. According to my calculations, like, you know, I'm like, who does that? And so you get the, the, the CD, and you start trying to figure out what you're supposed to do on the Internet, and there wasn't really much to it. It was just kind of like basically just staring at a world of Minecraft, you know, megapixels. And the, the, uh, our parents, you know, they really didn't let us even interact much on the internet they didn't know what it was I didn't know what it was but we had a computer we had the CD but if I ever wanted to get on I found out basically this AOL a messenger where you could talk to people and I, I was interested in trying to investigate outside into that world and interact with people and to sneak onto the internet in those days again it wasn't on your phone it was on this it was basically like your computer monitor I don't even know if I'm allowed to touch this I'm probably gonna get in trouble But this was your computer tower. And the monitor was like just as deep and wide as that. And and you stick the CD in there. But like to to, to sneak online in my day when I was your age, I would have to go downstairs and I would have to grab every pillow and its mother. And I would have to muffle it and get duct tape and duct tape around this tower. Because when you get connected to the internet in my day, dial-up is like the most intense sound. For 
five minutes, you got to suppress the dial-up internet. And if you, if you could get online without your parents waking up, you deserve it. You, I mean, you deserve it almost. I mean, I, not really, but I'm just, it, was, it was work if you wanted to sin in those days. Well, it's first night. <laughs> Dial-up internet. It was, a, it was a completely different world, and yet there were some similarities. And there, we, when we had a camp, you didn't go with your phone and, you know, all the Instagram and all these pictures. When you went to camp, you would go and you would uh, go to Walgreens or something of that sort. You guys have Walgreens out here? You guys know what that is? Okay, okay, I need to see some head momentum here, okay? All right, there we go. You would buy this cardboard device called a disposable camera. You guys, you, you don't know, you know what that is? Do they still make those? They do, come on, it's coming back, it's coming back. Disposable cameras. And, and you know, it's the only time I ever felt envious of not being a female. Because you can't walk around with a disposable camera as a guy. Unless you had a fanny pack, and then you were marked for life. But the girls, would, they would get, they bring the big purse, and they would stuff that purse full of disposable cameras. You know, we didn't have male European handbags in those days. A satchel, whatever you call them these days. Now don't get me started. But anyways, a merce, there we go, a merce. But the ladies would have their bags filled with these cameras. And, and when you would take a picture, you would wind it up. And it would be like, zzz, 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 zzz. and if you were rich, I mean, if your house flowed with milk and honey, you had a battery-operated one with a flash on it. It had flash photography. You were, you were a big deal to have a disposable camera and to have one with a flash on there. And so back in the day, you would try to take these pictures throughout the camp, and you, would, you, you couldn't do, like, there was no selfie sticks. And so when you're my size, you got to find a friend that's tall. Because, like, you know, when you got arms like T-Rex, you can't take a selfie. It's like going up my nose. And so you got to have a long friend with go-go gadget arms to take the picture for you. And he would stick that thing out there, and we would take pictures all week long. And just when you thought, like, you know, camp was over, it really just began. Because now you go home. And you take this pile of the, uh, cardboard cameras. And you would go to Walgreens to get them developed. I, I know you need interpretation for this kind of stuff. You would take it to the store. And they put it in the room. And they put it in this dark place for it to develop for their, the film. So you could see what the pictures were. And it was days later before you could ever see those pictures. But again, if you were like a rich snob that had, you know, the flashing camera, you probably found that newfound technology, same day development. It was revolutionary. It was revolutionary. You guys don't even know what I'm talking about. And so finally you would get those things and you would, you would unpack them after, or you go back to Walgreens, you buy them and you go home and you look in that and you look at all your pictures because you want to show your friends, your family, you know, that girlfriend that, you know, she didn't know she was your girlfriend but you're going to claim her as your girlfriend in the picture. And all of a sudden when the moment comes, it's all out of focus. That selfie's a messy it don't look right. It don't look good. I promise you guys, you look a lot better than this. I, pr I promise you. And none of it turned out. And then, like, there's always the great moments where you forget that you had a camera. And your mom tells you to clean your room, like, a year later, and you find a camera in the closet you forgot about. It's like Christmas all over again. I'm telling you, it was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the 90s. The principle is still the same, but you guys live in a completely different world than I do. The moment I disclose my age, you've already tuned me out. 37 years old. What does a 37-year-old life-size bobblehead know about me? I don't claim to know much, but 
the principles of my life and the principles of your life are the same. And you can look at an old archaic book called the Bible and feel as if it cannot relate to the day I am living in. It cannot speak to the day that I'm living in. An old preacher cannot speak to the day that I'm living in. But I, I want you to know the Bible was very much aware of the day that you would be living in. And the Bible even speaks about these technologies that we find ourselves interacting with and learning. If you're taking notes, I see everybody's got their pen and paper out. That's fantastic. I would encourage you to jot a, f- a few verses down if you would. If they, if they want to throw these up on the screen, they can. If not, no worries. Just listen. 1 Timothy 5.13 speaks about social media. 1 Timothy 5.13 speaks about your Instagram account. It speaks about your Facebook account. It speaks about the advent of the Internet. And here's what the Scripture says. They learn to be idle, wandering about house to house. See, back in the day, social media construct was this. You physically go somewhere to do things you're not supposed to do. But in 2021, we digitally go somewhere doing things we're not supposed to do. You had to go to so-and-so's house, physically get up, make the trek and the journey to go have the discussion. The woman at the well, that was a hot spot. That was a place where people would go and congregate for social media gatherings. But today, we don't have to get up from where we're, we don't have to get up from bed all day. We can sit in bed all day, and your parents bring you your food, and you're sitting there on the internet, on social media, going from house to house to house. It goes on to say this, they're not only idle, but they're tattlers, busybodies. That means gossiping. It goes on to say, speaking things they ought not. Well, man, if you ever want to encapsulate what social media is, people learning to be idle, going from house to house, talking about people, and talking about things they ought not to talk about. But of course, here in Mississippi, there's nobody in this room that does that. So this doesn't apply to anybody. But we've never been more busy doing nothing. Sitting there in front of a screen, speaking in thumbs. All day. And we feel like we did so much, and so much time passes, and yet nothing was accomplished but conversations That if we went back and looked at the transcript, we might actually blush. The Bible says in Ephesians 4, 29, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Another verse you can jot down, I see some of you actually taking notes, is Ecclesiastes 7, 21, and they could put it on the screen machine if they would like to. But it gives us an idea of how we should be handling our social media construct. And here's the advice that the wisest man gives. Do not take heed to all the words that are spoken about you. You know what social media is? Aside from going house to house, talking about things we ought not to talk about, it's investigating and exploring to see what people are saying about us. We make a post, I don't know what your preferred method is, whether it's IG, FB, how it be, VIP, I don't know, whatever. And no no more than five minutes later, go right back, to see if anybody responded to it. Did someone put a thumb up? Did someone put a heart? Did someone put some sort of emoji? Did, Did somebody retweet it? Did somebody reply? Did somebody share it? And it didn't happen after five minutes, so we go back in one minute just to see if anybody is saying anything. And all of a sudden, there's nothing being said after you made your post. Oh, God is so good. He's so wonderful. I I love the Lord. And the only person that put a thumb up was your mother. And you're like, stupid mom. Get off my screen. 
But nobody in Mississippi thinks that way. And so you don't get what you hope for, so you do the other side of the coin. I hate my life. My life is terrible. I just don't even, I'm so ugly. I'm so stupid. Nobody loves me. I just, I'm going to quit. I'm going to walk away from church. But nobody in Mississippi does it. And all of a sudden, ping, 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 ping. You got 23 comments. You got a bunch of emoticons. Everyone, oh, girl, you're the best. You're beautiful. You're awesome. You're great. You're incredible. And all of a sudden, ah. Something inside of you was fed. We okay? I promise you we're going to go somewhere here in just a little bit and the Holy Ghost is going to move. But I want to speak to where you are living right now. Let me just throw this out there. You know what? When any t- There's a few rules that I live by when it comes to social media. One of them, it comes from Ecclesiastes 7.21 and it comes from 1 Timothy chapter 5 that we just read. One, I, 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 don't, I don't go investigating from house to house. I used to do it where I would, I would look at this church and that church and this preacher and that preacher and try to investigate, see what's going on in their world and try to see, oh, you know, find out all the gossip, all the, the headline news, all that kind of stuff. And all of a sudden I realized I just, I just blew 30 minutes. I just wasted one hour. I just, and, and, and really all that I'm trying to do is trying to get gossip and trying to get information that I have no business knowing about anyways. And so I just, I, 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 I made my own little Ten Commandments. I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm not, I don't want to be a gossip, and I don't want to waste time. And also I put another thing when I read Ecclesiastes 7.21, because there was something inside me that I, I would put something out there, and then I keep going back to my phone to try to see if anyone responded. And all of a sudden the Holy Ghost just kind of checked me. What are, what are you looking for, Mark? What are you after? Why do you need that so bad? And it was, it was a pride that was inside of me. You know, I've only been preaching around for about eight years out uh, across the country. I mind my own business. I've been 15 years pastor in South Dakota, minding my own business. And then for whatever reason, the past eight years, I've been able and privileged to be across this country. And when I first started, I would put all these posts out there and selfies of being at this place and that place. Oh, I'm just so humbled, honored to preach this event. Humble, right? And share how many this and how many that. Waiting to see how many responses so I can validate who I was and find my value. You okay? We're, gonna, we're just going to go right at it here tonight, okay? And so doing all these kind of things and trying and then also not getting it and feeling this way and then also sharing sad things. All and so I felt, I felt convicted. Don't look to see what anybody says about you. And so I just put it in my Ten Commandments. I'm not going to look at comments. I'm not going to look at emotions. I'm not going to look at reactions. I'm not going to follow that. I don't want to be addicted and brought under the power of that. I don't want my affirmation and my validation to come from people. I want it to come from God. And when we keep going to a post to find a sense of value, we are going to the wrong source to find a sense of value. The reason why a number of you feel so insecure and inferior is because you're going to the wrong source. If you had a daily prayer life, if you had a prayer closet, and you talked to the Lord for an amount of time, you would find out who you really are and what you are in Him, that you're a child of God, that you are fearfully and wonderfully. Another thing, I don't, I don't put negative things out there. When I'm down, I, I have depressing days. I have bad days. I have rough days. But I have determined that I am not going to hang that junk out there for people to just get some sort of sympathy. What I learned to do is go to God first. And when I go to God first with my depression, when I go to God first with my anxiety, when I go to God first with my trial and my temptation, I have found out he takes care of it and I don't need to take it to other people. you got to learn to take your needs to the Lord in prayer. If there's ever something that you need to have in this hour, it's a prayer life. Prayer still takes care of everything. (laughs) 
Google's in your Bible. You know that? They, if they want to put up Psalm 64, verses 4 through 6, Google's right there in your Bible. It talks about people shooting secret at the perfect and not fearing, having no fear, no reservation, you know, keyboard commandos. And the dog, you just talking smack, talking trash. And then all of a sudden they saw someone perfect. Bold as a lion behind your keyboard. And all of a sudden in public, oh, I'll give you a hundred, brother. Yeah. But look at verse six. They search out iniquities. They accomplish a diligent search. The search engine. All Google is is an extension of a dilemma that's inside of us. Searching and looking diligently. And the truth be told, most of the things we search for are not productive to our walk with God. They prohibit our walk with God. They... I'm going to hurry up. What time is it? 9.14. What time do I got to be done? But, but do be honest. When I go along, just say... Like, you won't hurt my feelings because I'm really tired. I'll tell you what I know about social media. What I have learned is that social media is evidence that we all have time to read our Bible and pray. This whole, well, I, I don't got time to read my Bible. I don't got time to pray. Look, I got ADHD elemental P as well. I believe our diagnosis, if you can't sit there and watch a two-hour movie or be on social media for one hour, I believe your diagnosis. Our problem has never been attention span. It's been appetite. That which you have an appetite for, you will give attention to. We've got to get a hunger and a thirst after righteousness. And if we get a hunger and a thirst for righteousness, God will fill that void. Now I realize I sound like some old codger. I know I sound like some jerk. But I'm here really to help you. I'm not mad at you. I just want you to make up your mind not to let the digital world determine your spiritual world. It's the first thing we reach for every day. It's the very thing that, it's the weight that so easily besets us. This, this device that doesn't even weigh not even a quarter of a pound. I don't know how many grams or ounces it is, but it's got us pulling down. We get a smartphone before we get a rattle these days. It's wild. Completely different world that we're living in. But here's what I want to address here. Is that there is an effect from this device that we have to be aware of. We got to know the profound implications of this. How can we so freely do things here that we would not do in real time, in real place, in the physical? But in the digital, there's this liberty to just run wild and free and explore. It's called the effect of anonymity online or perceived anonymity. And its impact cannot be underestimated because it fuels something called online disinhibition. What, what, what happens when you're on that world, there's a great book. I would encourage you to read it if you ever get bored. There's not a lot of pictures on there. It's not scratch and sniff or pop up, so I don't know if you like it or not. But it, it, it's called the cyber effect, and it, it discusses about human behavior online. It's a psychologist, psychotherapist, whatever that's basically focusing on the digital world. And our human behavior, she states, is amplified and accelerated online. There is more trust and more information given online. Self-disclosure goes from 40% that you would disclose to somebody in person to 80% online. It says it is the equivalent of you being under the influence of alcohol, being tipsy, being drunk, where you begin to let your guard down and begin to disclose information. We do things in that environment that we would not do in another environment. Like, which one of you ladies 
would be walking outside. Well, hopefully, wait till winter time. It's so humid out there. I don't know how you guys do it. But what, what, what one of you ladies would walk outside and you see a stranger across the street that's just like really eerie and creepy and say, so, you know what? I think I want to go talk to him. Hi, how you doing? My name's so-and-so. I live at 903 Second Street Northwest and I just... Uh... Like who would do that? But we'll be on our phone and do the exact same thing. Now, look, if I, if I share a carnal story this week, it, 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 it's B.C., you know, before COVID. I haven't always lived for the Lord, by the way. Just throw that out there. But, like, I was born and raised in the south suburbs of Chicago, and, and we, would, we would go clubbing. And uh, it's a horrible environment. But there's something that always ticked me off about clubbing is when you go to these atmospheres, you see some of the ugliest dudes there with 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 these girls that are like way out of their league. You know what I'm saying? Like a three with a ten, you're like, what? Is that too deep? Oh, that's, ask me later. There's no way that ten would give that three a time of day. If that, if that dude walked up to her and started touching her body and dancing on her, she, she would call the police and slap him and run. But you take those two people in a different environment. It's, there's nothing different other than the environment. And this is what we must understand. That the digital world and the physical world, we've got to bridge the gap and get a little common sense of what we're doing in this world over here. We okay? I, I told you we're just going to do a little teaching here for a moment. Everything we do leaves a digital fingerprint. The digital world is real, if not more real than the physical world. Or at least it has something called real world consequences. This illustration maybe may help you to comprehend something that I'm saying is, I know you guys have Walmart. I was just at Walmart before I came here. Thank God for Walmart. Doesn't have to do what he did. So the Lord gave us Walmart, and I was there. And if anyone ever been to Walmart? A couple people? Okay. Don't raise your hand for this next one, okay, and it, because we're not going to have confession right now. But how many here would walk into Walmart, go to the CD aisle, if they even still have those, and grab a bunch of CDs or DVDs, Stick them in your pocket, your male European handbag, your satchel, fanny pack, and walk out of Walmart with those CDs. We wouldn't do that. Because there is so much nerves going on and fear. I'll get caught. I'm getting in trouble. I know that's wrong. That's not right. Now let me ask this question. Don't raise your hand. How many of you have downloaded music that you never paid for. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. Now, don't get mad at me. Why do we have such liberty and freeness to do one and not the other? Because we think there's not consequence in the digital world, only in the physical world. But did you know, now it's not very likely, but if they ever pursued you and followed your digital fingerprint and caught you extracting and streaming things that you do not have license to, it's a federal offense. If you do it at Walmart, it's petty theft. So now ask yourself, which one has greater consequence? Going to federal prison or petty theft and a fine? I'm telling you right now, this digital world has greater consequence than we lead ourselves to believe. Yep. You may not physically be in the presence of that girl performing that act. 
And you may not physically be in the presence of that man performing that act. But I want you to know there are some consequences when you start playing with sin in the digital world and you're not going to come out of it clean. I wonder if there could be a lifting of the voice for just a moment. Holy Ghost, we need you right now. I pray, God, your presence usher in these next few moments. I pray, God, you take scales off of eyes. I pray a spirit of revelation would usher into this room. Now again, B.C., before COVID, I went, to, I went to a place called Panama City, Florida for spring break. Not to hand out tracks, by the way. I went there with a friend to party. It's a mile-long city of just party atmosphere. And uh, we, we had a camera that I got from my parents. It's VHS. You guys don't know what that is. But it's VHS camera. Now, it was a big deal to have one that you didn't have to carry like a bazooka on your shoulder. It was like, you know, wow. So we had this, and we went out to party. And my friend and I, we, uh, we met up with some girls, and we were going to go to the club with them and go party. But a storm front swept in, and, like, the waves started, like, coming in, crashing. They are really big. And uh, it, was, it was pretty impressive. So my friend and I, before we went, we wanted to, you know, just kind of run and attack the waves. And like, you know, ah, phew, you just punch them or something. And, um, and I was getting sucked in the water. And then I get spit out and seaweed and all this kind of stuff. And I, I go to get a, catch my breath and get ready to go to the club. And I look for my friend. And he's still, he's like frantically looking in the water. I go, bro, what are you doing? We got to go. He goes, I lost my glasses. What knucklehead? Or is there glasses in the ocean? If you're here, don't tell me. But he, he didn't have the rubber band around it or something. And so I'm like, what? He's like, you got to help me find my glasses. My parents are going to beat me. And they really would. So I felt a little bad for him. I was like, okay, well, we'll look for your glasses in the ocean in a storm. This is great. So I put on my snorkel. I, I, I had a little, if you guys don't know what that is, it's what you need outside right now. I put on my snorkel, and I get in the water, and the ocean's like just pulling me and pushing me, and I'm getting hit with rocks and seaweed, and I'm looking in the water, I'm like, this is so stupid, this is so stupid, this is so stupid, this is so stupid. And I get out of the water, I'm trying to, come on, let's go, let's go, they're gone, they're, the, the glasses are lost. And he's like on the verge of breaking down crying. And so I'm like... All right, we'll look for your glasses. And for whatever reason, I just, I did this. I said, God, if you help me find his glasses, I won't go clubbing. I won't do any partying. The rest of this week is for you. So I put the goggles on. I got in the water. And the first wave crashed. And the glasses hit me in the face. And landed in my hand. I'm standing on the beach. My friend's still looking. And I don't know how long I stared at them. And how long he was looking for his glasses, but I had them. And he gets out of the water. He goes, What are you doing? I go, I found your glasses. He's like, that's great. Yeah. Great. I gave him the glasses. I went back to the hotel. And I made an altar. And I made right with God. It was a miraculous moment. Fast forward a couple weeks later, we're back in the, the south suburbs of Chicago. And I'm in my room reading my Bible, and I get a knock on the door. Mijo! It's my Mexican mama from Tijuana. 
I'm like, see, mama. She goes, big medica. I was like, uh oh. When she starts speaking Spanglish, you're in trouble. And she opens the door and she goes, I found your camera. The camera was before I found the glasses. Did God forgive me? But the sin was archived. And someone was able to retrieve my past. God will forgive you of any sin you commit. But I want you to know anything you do on this device is there permanently. And it can be archived. You hear me very carefully. There's a, I feel already that there is a call of God on so many in this room. And there's going to be a wave that comes through this week of a call of God that's going to go on to your lives. But a call of God is not permission to be carnal and casual. The call of God is a call to diligence, to live a life of sanctification and holiness and separation. And this little device right here is going to hold so many people's calling hostage. Because what's going to happen, you're going to find an altar with God. God's going to do a mighty work in your life. But when you go back home, that enemy is going to archive your past, those pictures that you sent out, that party you are at. We've got to be diligent with our call of God. We cannot be casual. We cannot let our guard down. What you have is a high calling. What you got is too precious to be so lax with this. Can you lift your hands? I'm hurrying up. It's 9.30. I've been preaching about 35 minutes. We okay? Keep praying. Lift your voices. I'm trying to be very sensitive here. I'm trying to be obedient. We're talking about where no remission is. And I'm here to give you an insight and a hopefully God willing a revelation from the Spirit that where no remission is, is in this world. This world will never, ever let you forget. I, I, I remember when, you know, iOS software updates that come every year. I remember one of the iOS software updates when it came. And, and uh, I went to um, start exploring it. And I went to my iTunes. And all of a sudden, like, uh, Skittles pops up or Eminem or whatever. And so, all of a sudden, all this old music starts surfacing. I'm like, man, I... I deleted that. I haven't listened in a long time. But Apple had record of everything I used to listen to. Everything I used to purchase. And brought it all right back. There's nothing you do on this device that's forever gone. TikTok is not forever gone. Your storyline is not forever gone. It may not be easily traceable and accessible to some people, but you better believe that it's still out there in that digital sphere somewhere. It just takes one hacker. It doesn't even take a hacker anymore. It's as simple as a screenshot. One screenshot can dethrone your destiny. One screenshot. You get all bold in the moment. The Lord spoke to me. He says, this generation doesn't lack passion. It lacks temperance. You don't know how to restrain yourself from your emotions. In the heat of a moment, you'll fly off the cuff and text the most venomous message and send it out. Or some personal information and fully disclose it to the entire youth group. Just so you can get vengeance on somebody in your youth group. And all of a sudden, conviction catches up a little later. You're like, oh, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? It's too late. It's out there. Ladies, listen to me. There is not a single guy in this world worth you sending a nude image to. <laughs> Hold the clapping for just a moment. Hold the clapping for just a moment so I can communicate and you don't lose it, okay? I don't care how popular it is. 
I don't care how much your heart fawns for him. You don't send no picture in your underwear. You don't send no picture of you being in your bedroom. He doesn't need to see what your bedroom looks like. You don't send one image to him. And I know in the Holy Ghost that there are women in this room that you have let your guard down. You have let your guard down. But I want you to know I am not here to slam damn and condemn you. I'm to let you to know that Jesus loves you. And he'll, don't clap yet. He loves you and he will forgive you. But you've got to learn from your past mistake. That that guy, he can use the word love all he wants. But let me give you a revelation about teenage boys. They're pigs. There is not a single guy in this room that ain't a pig. When he's asking you for pictures. You don't give him a single picture. You don't give him a single photo. What you have is holiness and godliness. You don't need to give that up for some boy who in one week is going to move on. You know why he wants that picture? He just wants a trophy. The moment he gets it, he's going to send it to all his friends. And all of a sudden it's going to blow up in your face. And you're going to have so much shame on you, you're not going to even feel like you want to go back to the youth group. Because the youth group already saw everything. This is why we've got to deal with the situation this day. We've got to get serious about what we're doing with our devices. Look, you got a purpose on your life. You got an anointing on your life. You got a call of God on your life. And men, I know as a teenage boy that there's all these wild emotions going on inside of you. But you got to have a daily prayer life if you're ever going to knock out that daily struggle. If you're not praying daily, you're going to fall daily. If you're not reading the Bible daily, you're going to mess up daily. You've got to get that daily bread inside of you. And you've got to get a rhema word from above inside of you. You've got to crucify that flesh. We've got to get back to prayer. Maybe seated. I, I, you just tell me when to stop. We okay? I, I feel like teaching, but the moment you say stop, we can have an altar call right now. I know we can. But you just tell me when. I'm, I'm submitted. But hear me. There's a very intriguing book that my, my wife made me read. I would have never read it otherwise. But it's called I'm No Angel. I, I'm going to butcher her name. It's like Kylie Brissetti. And it's her personal story of achie achieving a childhood dream. Since she was a child, she wanted to be a model. And really, her dream came from everyone telling her that she should be a model. That's why we should be very careful with the words that we use with the young generation. Oh, you're so beautiful. You should be a model. No, 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 no. Compliment something worthwhile. Their giftings. Their personality. Don't reduce them to an accessory. And so, anyways, she ends up entering a contest for Victoria's Secret to be a model. It's like a reality show or something. And she ends up winning. She becomes an angel for Victoria's Secret. And the first time she's going to walk the catwalk as an angel, she has to sit in a chair for eight hours while they completely repigment her skin, rip off her eyelashes and eyebrows, and do them up the way they see the fit, and change her hair color. And after being in that chair for all those hours, then was she pretty enough to walk and represent Victoria's Secret. Just to give you a little insight. I thank God for modesty, shamefacedness, sobriety. I thank God for it. So, anyways... She, she, she does it, and she has a horrific story of all these things that happened to her in the process of trying to become a model. All these attacks and things like that. It's, it's very horrible. And um, in the process, she ends up getting converted to Christianity. And in her conversion, she starts feeling convicted about walking out there immodestly and being a bad example and a bad role model for future generations. It's a very intriguing book. And so she steps away from it. And what she ended up finding out is all these photographers that would take photos of her, they, they used inappropriate pictures of her in the nude that were never meant to go out. They were supposed, it was, those weren't the photo shoots, but they did it anyways, and they had those pictures, and they sold them out on the black market. And so when she went out as a Christian to teach on modesty and do these lectures, everybody would Google search her. 
But when they would type her name, the images was not a modest, wholesome Kylie. It was nude. It was inappropriate. And so she was so embarrassed, so ashamed. So she took it to the court system to try to get all those images out of there. And she won the case, but the judge basically just told her, look, there's, it is impossible for us to get rid of every single one of those images. It's just not possible. They're illegal. And if you went to court with somebody with that photo, you will win. But there's no way we could get it off the Internet. It's there forever. I'm here to expose the bold-faced lie of the devil. That the world is the most loving, welcoming, forgiving place. See, the devil wants you to think that the church is so judgmental. And they judge your past. And they're, they look down on you. And they think they're better than you. And they think they're holier than you. No, 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 no. It's the world that will never let you forget. It's the world where you will find there is no remission. Because the moment you turn your back on the world, the moment you offend someone, they're going to pull up your past and they're going to stab you in the back. I'm telling you, the world is the most vicious place. The world is the most hateful place. They will never... You know what? You know what politics is? You know what a... The political campaign is, it's one opponent versus the other archiving their past. This person can live a squeaky clean life for 25, 30, 40, 50 years. And you find one photo of them from 40 years ago. One quote of them 50 years ago. And the world will turn on you. If that should not give you an understanding that, look, the devil is not your homeboy. He's not your friend. He doesn't have your best interest. He's only here to steal, to kill, and to destroy. You have a blessed opportunity to step into the house of God. I'm going to hurry up. I'm going to hurry up. Whatever you're doing on the internet, whether you're looking at porn, whether you're speaking gossip about people, Numbers 23, 30, 32, 23 says, be sure of this, your sins will find you out. You will be caught. You will be found out. You can have your secret porn life. You can have your secret sexting. You can have all that you want, but it's going to come back and it's going to hurt it's why there's such high teen suicides because sexting information goes out there in the high school and they, are, they can't take the onslaught that floods them and all of a sudden they're overwhelmed and depressed. People lose their jobs over things done on their phones and social media. Let's lift our hands. I'm just about done. Holy Ghost, I pray you penetrate the heart of every young teenager that is here right now. God, I pray your spirit would go through this audience right now and awaken them. Awaken this generation to have discernment. Awaken this generation, God, to be sensitive enough to know that something is not right and not to give in to that emotion in the moment, but God, to exercise temperance, restraint, and self-denial. We've talked about where no remission is, but let me tell you where you can find remission. In the church. In the church. That opening sermon on the opening day of the founding of the church. What must we do? Stop trying to hide your sin and confess your sin. And after you confess, see, the devil wants you to be afraid of confession. Thinking that if you acknowledge it and confess it, that it will be used against you. But God says, no, if you acknowledge it, if you confess it, I can plunge it under the blood. I can put it under the name of Jesus for the remission.
The Bible says that in Acts 2.38, in the name of Jesus Christ, when you're baptized, it is for the remission of your sins. It says in Acts 22.16, why tarriest thou? What are you waiting for? Arise and wash away your sins. How? By calling on the name of the Lord. You, We don't have to wait around. I'm telling you, in this very moment, you can call on the name of Jesus in baptism and have every sin washed away. The Bible says in Leviticus 17 11, it is the blood that makes an atonement for the soul. The blood literally will cover the thing. The blood will literally encapsulate that, that, that sin, that forbidden element that is in our lives. Jesus said in Matthew 26 28, this is my blood. This is my blood that I shed for you. It's for the remission of sins. In Hebrews 12, 24, it's the blood that speaks better things. In Hebrews 9, 22, it says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. But the shedding of blood is where we find remission. In 2 Corinthians 8, 9, it gives us an understanding about Jesus. Though he was rich, he became poor. He could have came any way he wanted to. But Jesus came in poverty. So poor was Jesus. The family offering at the temple was one of poverty. So poor was Jesus when he grew up, he had no home. So poor was Jesus when he grew up, he had no property. So poor was Jesus, he never owned a bed. So poor was Jesus, he had to borrow boats for transportation. So poor was Jesus that he had to borrow a boy's lunch to feed other people. So poor was Jesus that he had to borrow a donkey on his last trip down that street of Jerusalem. So poor was Jesus that he had to borrow someone else's room to have his last meal. And so poor was Jesus that he had to borrow a rich man's tomb to be buried in. But the Bible says in Acts 20 and verse 28... When it came to your salvation, he didn't take out a loan. He didn't put it on credit. This is the church of God that he hath purchased with his own blood. It's the blood. It's the blood. It's the blood purchase that Jesus made when you were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The blood made an atonement. When you were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the blood was applied. When you were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, it was that blood that purchased your salvation. God gave everything for you to be saved. God sacrifice so you can have your sins remitted ah lift your hands lift your voices Come on, are you thankful for the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ? It's the blood that gives me strength from day to day. It will never, ever, ever lose its power. We were bought with the precious blood of Jesus. How many here have been baptized in Jesus' name? Would you lift your hand? Keep that hand up. Look around. Oh, what you got to experience is a powerful revelation. The Bible says in the book of Exodus chapter 38 and verse 8, that type and shadow of the church in the Old Testament, after they would sacrifice at the altar, they would go to the brazen laver. And the brazen laver was made out of looking glasses or mirrors. And so when that priest would come, he would look into that pool of water and he would see his reflection and he would see the blood on him realizing his guilt, seeing his guilt. But then he was to immerse in the water. And when he immersed in the water and that blood was washed, that water now took on the pigment of the blood 
And when that priest looked into that water, he could now see his reflection through the filter of the blood. You can spend one hour on your little Instagram page trying to have the perfect filter and the perfect photo, but it will never, ever have greater power than the blood of Jesus when you're baptized in the name that is above every name. You have something that's so awesome and so powerful. Ah, samarararaka. I want you to gather around this front. If God's been speaking to you through this sermon, I want you to gather around as close as you can. I want as close as you can. Don't stop in the mid-aisle. Get as close as you can. We're going to have an altar call. And the Lord's going to help some people here. I know this is a lot of teaching. I know this is a little different tonight. But I'm praying that conviction has come in this room. I'm praying that revelation has come in this room. And I pray there will be a transformation that takes place. This right here. is going to be your biggest hurdle to the call of God and the purpose of God on your life. The floodgates have been open, and we're so casual and unmonitored in this era. We've handed you a loaded revolver and said, go ahead and have fun. I wish I had time to go through some teaching on things that we need to set up on the phone. Maybe I'll do it a little later this week. But it's why your generation, I, I, I looked tonight, powerful worship, powerful music, and I looked around, and maybe, maybe 10% of you are actually worshiping. Maybe. I don't say that in a condescending way. I don't say it in an arrogant way. I'm just being real with you. The reason why you can't lift up holy hands is because your hands haven't been holy. There's wrath and there's doubting in this room. And you just know that if you do it, you're, you feel like a hypocrite. But God will forgive you this very night. Now, don't, don't, don't clap. Let me just teach for just a moment and help you understand something about forgiveness. One, I do believe forgiveness has a powerful effect and feeling of a load coming off of you. But some of you... The guilt is so strong that when you confess your sins and you go to repent, you don't feel all those feelings that you would like to feel. But let me help you. Forgiveness is not a feeling. Forgiveness is a promised reality. The Bible, hold on, hold on, hold on don't, don't miss this. I know you, I'm, I'm not trying to be mean. I'm, I'm just, I just want to make sure you hear. The Bible, you, you want to know how fast forgiveness works? It's been clocked at the speed of confession. That fast. Because it says in 1 John 1, 8, 9, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us of all of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And I'm talking to, it is thick in this room right now. There is much sexual perversion in this room. I'm not saying that to rub your nose in it, but I'm saying there is so much people in this room that are bound and that are full of shame that you went down a road you never intended to go. But I'm here to expose the lie of the devil. The world will never let you forget. But in this room is the power of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that will wash everything away. Now hold on. Let me give some instruction. Young people, you know a lot of people sins in this room, thanks to social media and text threads. If they're not going to find remission in the world, I hope they can find it in your youth group. Hear me in the Holy Ghost, because some people haven't come back to your youth group because everybody knows. And they don't feel they can find remission in your church. If you want Jesus to forgive you, you've got to forgive them. 
There's got to be forgiveness all around. Your church should be the safest place for teenagers to come with a history, a past that is miles long, gigabytes, terabytes long. And they should feel safe to come to your altar, your youth service, knowing, you know what? They'll take me in, and they'll forgive me, and God will forgive me. If you're here right now, there is such a heavy. I want you to lift your hands, and I want you to open your mouth, and I want you to begin to use your words and just say, Jesus, I'm sorry. I am sorry for every sin I've committed. I am sorry, God, for gossiping. I am sorry, God, for sending inappropriate images. God, I am sorry, God, for sending information about someone else in my youth group to the rest of the youth group. I ask you to forgive me right now, Jesus. God, I am sorry for every image that I have stared at. I am sorry for self-gratification. I am sorry for my lust. I am sorry for my anger. I am sorry for the sins that I committed. Come on, hear me right now. God's going to forgive you. Would you lift your voice? If you will open up and pour out... God will fill you up with his spirit. Come on, open up. There's remission in this room right now. Don't look around. Don't look at me. Don't look to anyone else. Just you and Jesus right now. Let's start off this camp with the blood of Jesus being applied. Come on, nobody should be looking around. No eyes open. No eyes open. Just you and Jesus in your closet prayer. Everybody, let us be one mind, one accord, one place. Let there be one mass repentance. Let there be one mass remission in the house of God. That's it. Don't look at me. Don't look at me. Come on, pray. Pray. This is your moment to have remission. Come on, confess that sin right now. God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm not going to hide anymore. The digital world has consequence. The digital world has consequence. Le mundo maha. Me roto taraka. Me rondo marare. I pray godly sorrow to work repentance unto salvation tonight. May godly sorrow work repentance not to be repented of. In the name of the Lord Jesus, let salvation sweep in this room. Let salvation usher in this room. That's it. Let the tears fall. Let the tears fall. That's good. Let it out. Let it out. Let it out. Let it out. God's here. He loves you. He loves you. He'll forgive you. Oh. That's it, youth workers. That's it, youth workers. There's so many teens here right now that are weeping. They need to feel that hand of remission on them. Come on, youth workers. Let's pray for these teens right now. There's so much being poured out right now. There's a surgery in the Spirit taking place right now. In the name of Jesus, I pray the gifts of the Spirit would be released in this room right now for altar workers to pray, Lord, with the word of knowledge. May altar workers pray with the word of wisdom. May altar workers pray with the gift of faith. May altar workers pray with the discerning of spirits right now. That's it. He's forgiving you. He's forgiving you. He's forgiving you. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. Hey. I said, pour it out. Pour it out. Not a whisper right now. Let there be groaning. Let there be intercession. Open up your inner person right now. Open up. Let the light of the Lord shine in. Let the light of the Lord shine in. Give him the secret place of your heart. Give him the secret place of your heart. 
Jose Mare, me rondo quiare, me rondo de la la la. Ha ha ha, yes, 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 yes. Samodoka. That's it. Tap into the wells of salvation right now.